Hello, I'm Sheena Gill, Executive Vice President and Chief Growth Officer with Cognitive Care. I'm delighted to kick off our 2021 video podcast series, Early Detect Studios, with our very own Dr. Suresh Athili. Dr. Athili is Cognitive Care's co-founder and chief scientist, a brilliant physician scientist. He is one of the leading medical oncologists in India with more than 220 stem cell transplants, nine patents, and four molecules attributable to his name. He is an alumnus of the prestigious Institute of Medical Sciences, BHU, and Ames. Dr. Athili is passionate about empowering AI and deep com computing within medicine and biology to enable early detection of disease. Dr. Athili, welcome to our video podcast series. Thank you, Sheena. Glad to be here. So today's World Cancer Day, and it's a day wherein we raise awareness of cancer to encourage its prevention, its detection, you know, from gestation to geriatrics. Given that cognitive care's mission is to detect diseases early from gestation to geriatrics, let's raise some awareness. So the first question I have for you, Dr. Athili, is with the current standards of medicine and practice, from the healthcare worker's perspective, what are the common signs of cancer and how are we detecting cancer today? So um, uh, the answer goes back to age old days and the classically it is driven by the symptoms of the patients. Mm -hmm. So we call the change in the voice that is indicative of some head and neck cancers, change in the appetite, Lack of appetite is one of the very crude signs of the cancer. It can be there for ten other diseases as well. Mm -hmm. So any abnormal bleeding, any abnormal ulcers which are not healing, uh, a discoloration in any part of the skin, or lump somewhere you found which is external to the body, change in the bladder habits or bowel habits, or nagging cough which is not getting better. So these are classical ten signs which the World Health Organization has given as a bulletin way back in 1990 mm -hmm. for the public. If you have any of these symptoms, it's a time that you should consult your physician mm -hmm. who will do the physical examination and then just refer to a specialist if there are any signs and symptoms of the cancer. This is what we call as a science of the cancers or symptoms of the cancers. Sure. Then once the physician walks to us, then we how further deeper look in terms of doing some physical examinations on the patients and there are some characters that uh, like a hard lump uh, or uh, a, a thing which is indurated in and around so there are some physical signs which uh, prompts the doctor to think more in lines of a cancerous lesion rather than a non-cancerous lump this is grossly how a general public understands about the signs and symptoms of the cancer. So as a physician, are you satisfied with this? Uh, do you feel there are limitations in existing cancer treatment and detection methods? I mean, do you think we can do better? Absolutely. So the question can be uh, split into two ways. Uh, what uh, the governments or public are doing uh, for early detection and what an individual is doing for the early detection. Mm -hmm. So uh, epidemiologically speaking, uh, it is uh, cost effective or resource effective to screen only the common cancer. It doesn't mean that if I, I don't get an uncommon cancer, right? So if you speak about the cancer screening, all over the world speak it's about six diseases. For the women, breast, cervical, and ovarian cancers, unique to her. For the men, prostate cancer. Commonly, you speak about colorectal cancer mm -hmm. and lung cancer. So right. they form 80% of all cancers. So that is the reason why the entire government or entire uh, medical force is focusing on these six cancers to screen them, right? Whereas for an individual, I may have a different family history. Mm -hmm. I need to have a different type of screening method uh, which should be tailor-made for me. Correct. So the Cancer screening, which is existing now, addresses 80% problem, assuming that we're doing a great job, but the misses are too many misses. Right, right. Even today, even today, I would like to draw to the attention of one of these slides. Probably if you can see here uh, the picture, 
it says the biological onset of the disease that means when the cancer starts then the second point is early diagnosis is possible either by blood test or by a biopsy or by imaging mm -hmm. then the third point is clinically the patient comes with either signs or symptoms and ultimately the patient gets cured or dies mm -hmm. so this is a period where 90% of today's efforts are there to screen the cancer, right? So before the signs and symptoms develop, but I should have a good test to detect it. But majority of the non-curable cancers, the critical point or CP is here. Mm -hmm. That's what is elusive to most of the medical oncologists. We are not completely happy because we miss majority of the cancers because mm -hmm. the CP is in the CP1 zone and that's frustrating. That's that's very interesting and a very compelling case for us to continue efforts towards the emerging technologies that can help us diagnose uh, earlier. So, um, Dr. Atili, are there genetic components of cancer? I mean, how are physicians using genetic information in the diagnosis, detection, and treatment of cancer today? Um, how is the availability of genetic components changing cancer detection and diagnosis? So uh, genes have entirely changed. I, I graduated uh, doing my DM way back in 2000. So in those mm -hmm. days, genetics were hardly available. So we mm -hmm. used to predominantly base our diagnosis based upon the gross eye. That mm -hmm. is, the, the, what we see in the microscope is what is viable to us. Mm -hmm. So it's something like, it is not changeable. Then came the era of chemical uh, introduction of the chemical uh, technologies to the uh, cancer detection, what we call the immunohistochemistry. So that means we use, apply some chemicals and then see how the cancer cells are reacting, and then we are able to classify them in a much better way. Right. Then came the era of flow cytometry and genetics, and it changed. For example, chronic myeloid leukemia previously was diagnosed on bone marrow. Now I need not puncture the bone to take the blood out. If mm -hmm. there is a gene called B or ABL, I'm just giving an example. So that's how the cancer is. So that is for the detection of cancer. And we use it for the classification of the cancer. Like lung cancer is no more the same entity. You have EGFR, you have ALK, you have ROS, you have PDL1. Right. Each one indicates a specific outcomes or specific prognosis, we call it. Mm -hmm. The disease outcomes are different. And the same thing, same genes can be targeted with medicines. Like I have wonderful drugs called Jefferson for the EGFR positive lung cancers, or mm -hmm. we have Tamoxifen, Letrozole for the breast cancer, which are expressing ER and PR. So the genes tell us how the cancer develops. Interesting. Like few genes indicate that they are hereditary cancers, or they are tobacco induced cancers, or they are viral induced cancers. The genes tell us how fast the cancer is growing the genes tell us where all the cancers can grow like this cancer mm -hmm. is likely to go to bones or this cancer is likely to go to brain like that they wow, tell us what is the ideal treatment to pick up i mean i, I can uh, they, if there are 10 drugs the genes will tell exactly what drug to pick up so it has mm. entirely changed between 20 and 2020 in two decades the way we treat is entirely different. That's Except from two other cancers. Change yeah. a lot, Sheena. That's phenomenal. And, and who's to think what it's going to be like in another 20 years, right? So uh, can you the speak to cancer in say. that's right, absolutely. So can right. you speak to cancer in maternal health and pediatric health? I mean, where do we stand today with early detection and prevention and treatment for these populations? So that's exactly a very tough question to answer, Shina, because mm -hmm. in the maternal health, uh, I need to take care of two lives, like both right. mother and kid, right? The problem is the cancer treatments are designed to kill the cells, not to modify the cells. And right. all the cancer treatments will kill any cell that divides. Because cancer divides 10 times faster than a normal cell, that's how the treatment right. is designed. So that's the reason right. why hair grows, so you have a hair fall, 
you know, the WBC grows, you have a WBC fall. Unfortunately, right. fetus also grows. Mm -hmm. Very unfortunately, fetus also grows. So the moment I give a cancer, anti-cancer treatment to save the mother's life, I may be jeopardizing on fetal health. That's tough. You know, yeah. uh, it, 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 that's very tough. It's very, you know, sometimes emotionally very traumatic. So in the, in the, in the intention of saving a mother's life, I'm practically killing or damaging significantly the fetus, which right. is a very disheartening sort of thing. We, what we a predicament for physicians. Own, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, and one more problem that we need to face is uh, young women come to my practice more often than none, and young men also, right? So we give chemotherapy. So the gonads are on the prime time of dividing, like ovaries right. and testes. Right. And these chemotherapy drugs damage it. And God forbid, and if at all some mutation happens, and if the bad ovum gets fertilized, or if the bad sperm fertilizes the ovary, then you know the fetus is not going to be all right. So they will be born with a lot of defects. So wow. uh, uh, maternal or uh, pregnancy in cancer is extremely tough pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes we need to take some tough calls like to save mother versus fetus. Right. So again, pregnancy is divided into early pregnancy and late pregnancy, when to deliver, how mm -hmm. safe it is. If you delay the treatment, cancer kills the mother. If you initiate the treatment, treatment kills the baby. Wow, what a, you know, it, it seems so to be very the, complex. Absolutely, and we want some more uh, concrete ways to make our decisions, right? Uh, we feel mm -hmm. still that science is not 100% accurate and mm -hmm. we go most of the times by our gut rather than the science here. Wow, that's 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 a tough one. That's a tough one. So, you know, I, I was also curious to ask you about the differences in the types of cancer. I mean, breast cancer, lung cancer, skin cancer. I know you address that a little bit in the beginning, but you know what advancements have occur occurred in these fields that you know might be of interest to our audience as it relates to detection and treatment that's available today in 2021. Right. Uh, if I have to just classify them into the advancements in early detection, diagnosis, classification, and treatment. So probably let me put it in the different heads uh, for the audience to understand in a better way. Right, sure. so the breast cancer and lung cancer, uh, the imaging have gone way ahead. So previously we used to have only digital mammograms. Now we have MR mammograms, and handheld devices using some advanced mathematics and computing started detecting the breast cancer much early. We have some mm -hmm. breath analyzers that can detect lung cancer. We have some mm -hmm. capsules that can detect the esophageal cancer. The skin cancer, just a slight change in the color, which is not practical to be identified by naked eye, can be determined mm -hmm. with the advancements of the, uh, the images that have been analyzed in those things. Right? For Very these cancers, yeah, the diagnostics have gone significantly ahead, and then we are detecting more and more cancers, predominantly by virtue of uh, more awareness, as well as mm -hmm. advancements in the diagnostic tests. So these are the two things. Coming to the classification, yep, that's that's where uh, um, the genes come into the picture. The breast cancer is no more a breast cancer. It is divided into luminal A, luminal B, had to reach triple negative, whatnot. I mean, so is the lung cancer, EGFR positive, PDL1 positive, immune therapy sense two, and ROS ALK. A, a lot of the the lung cancer previously used to be small and non-small cell. Now the lung cancer is fifty different cancers. Wow. So the skin cancers. Mm -hmm. So and, and and it's we are going more and more personalized in understanding right. how the cancer came and what to target. Understood. Right. So that's exactly changed the treatment as well, right, Sheena? Absolutely. Absolutely. So circling back to Cognitive Care's mission, what emerging technologies are out there to help with the early detection and moreover the prevention of cancer? And from a physician scientist perspective, 
why is this so important? You know, what can be done to leverage emerging technologies to enhance a doctor's clinical decisions to save more lives? So uh, I can I can say that this question again is quite long answer probably. So I'll just sure. uh, split the question for my understanding. Uh, okay. Early detection, we need to understand how the cancer starts, right? So if you have two sets of genes, one from the father, one from the mother, you have two guardians. So unless the damage happens both to the, the gene from the father and mother, cancer don't happen. So this was invented way back by a great scientist called Nutsum. So he called it Nutsum double hypothesis. So there have to be two hits, mm -hmm. right? If at all, mm -hmm. with some bad fortune, a bad gene that is hereditary cancer is acquired from the mother. Let's say you BRCA is acquired by uh, a, a baby, which is uh, this thing. So one gene is already damaged. So the probability of getting damage to the other gene is very high. So you can mm -hmm. get younger cancers. I so see. to understand how the cancer happens is very individualistic. If I'm prone for cancers, even the slightest tobacco or smoke can damage the other gene and very soon I develop cancer. But if my both the genes are strong, even if I smoke for say for some time, I'm relatively immune. Here I don't mind to promote the smoking, but I'm just telling you know, this is what happens, right? It is all right. uh, designed by your genetics. So first understand your genetics first. Then comes the second dimension for this, that is lifestyle. Uh, if you look at WHO circle, 35% of the cancer today are caused by diet and 30% by tobacco. Very interesting. So that's very, very interesting, right? And mm -hmm. it's likely to become 50% by 2025. So not very far. Wow. So we eat deep fried foods, high in fats, high in calories, low in fibers. So a whole array of things starting from the breast cancer, colon cancer, what not, all of these things are caused by your poor diet and poor lifestyle. You don't mm -hmm. walk, a lot of sedentary lifestyle, a lot of screen time that is going to put a lot of stress. We use oh, yes. a lot of radiation. You know, we use mobile two hours a day. We don't care about how much radiation is getting emitted by the cell phones or well, I mean, so you have to live in 2020. You can't go. You can't go back to 1980s, right? So, but right. Uh, again, we need to be judicious in using all these things, starting from the mm -hmm. food, use of the gadgets, having a proper lifestyle, calm down, and not to let uh, the hormones go in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all these factors. There's the second domain. The third domain is be aware of yourself. If you have a slight lump in the breast or anywhere, or if, if you're passing blood in the stools, or if you have some change of the color of your skin, mm -hmm. so then it's a time that you should seek the medical attention early. Right? And if you already know that your family history is there, if someone is having cancer, it's always good to take a genetic counseling. Absolutely. Right? So these are all the things. So, so all the domains which causes cancer have to be addressed in total rather than in isolation. I see. Absolutely. Right? So understand your genes well, understand your, uh, what we call as a, uh, the environment, uh, that is the lifestyle and other things, uh, and the environment factors. Vaccinate, very important. Mm -hmm. So today we are in the era of vaccines. Hepatitis B vaccine prevents liver cancer caused mm -hmm. by hepatitis B. And human Absolutely. papilloma virus, Cervical cancer is prevented, right? Few of the head right. and neck cancers. So there are ways to prevent the cancer if you understand how the cancer happens. So going back, the science is evolving very rapidly and human cognition right. is having limitation, right? You need to have a super brains working parallelly together to assimilate all the knowledge you have trillions of genes contributing right. to the cancer. It is humanly impossible to you know, understand the interaction. So use advanced mathematics, advanced computing, 
like what we use in the cognitive phase. Right. Like so that, that's where absolutely. the concept. That's where the concept exactly is. So there is an intersection of science, environment, biology, and genes. Everything. So that 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 point has to be properly identified, and I need to have a unique system. Right. So that particular score or what your name you want to give tells me the right path to adapt. They say that my genes are strong, but my environment is bad. My risk is X. So if my risk is high, what are all the things that are contributing to the high risk? Is it my gene? Is it the environment? Is it the lifestyle? Is it the medication? Is it the lack of vaccination? Is it my immunity? That mm -hmm. has to be defined. So early detection, as I told you, is a very complex phenomenon. So unless you understand all the domains and fix everything, you can't properly give my risk. Unless I know my risk, I don't seek attention. If I don't seek attention, the cancer is diagnosed late. I hope absolutely. I partially yeah. answer your question. Oh, absolutely. And it seems it seems to me, especially towards the, the latter part of your answer, that the next 20 years getting us to that sci-fi world, it is it is AI and ML that will help us get there, help us get an understanding of triaging parent, uh, patients and, and understanding risk uh, at well in advance to hopefully, you know, mitigate, manage, and possibly even prevent cancer from happening. So right. So right, Gina. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, we absolutely are delighted that you are our inaugural guest and we thank ev our entire audience for joining us in this series. We hope you will join us for the rest of them. Until then, thank you from Cognitive Care. Thank you very much, Shira. Namaste.